friends and family to our online worship service. My name's Melissa, I'm your service host today, and I'm so glad that you're here. The worship team is gonna lead us in a really beautiful worship song right now. So we wanna encourage you to sing along with us wherever you are on the other side of that screen. And if you would, take a moment and tell us who you are. Drop your name in the chat right now. And our online host would just like to say, hey, we're glad that you're here. Enjoy this time of worship.
and I hope you enjoyed that worship time. Hey, we want to know who you are on the other side of this screen. So if it's your first time with us or you're newish to the Crossway family, would you take a moment and fill out our digital connect card? We're going to drop the link now in the chat and we'll also do it at the end of the service for you. Let us know who you are and how we can pray for you and support you this week as your extended family of faith. And as always, if you're a part of the Crossway family, we want to encourage you to give and give generously to the Lord through your tithes and your offerings. Because together, our giving fuels the mission of our church and all that God is doing, not only online, but in person and beyond in our community. My family and I give on the Crossway Church South Florida app, or you can give on our website, and we're gonna drop a link in the chat now for your giving. Hey, this past Friday night, we had an incredible time at our Sisterhood Spring Connect event. But ladies, don't worry, if you weren't able to join us, we'll have another one coming up in the summer months. But I wanted to let you know that we have some great opportunities for Sisterhood community here at Crossway. So if you want to get involved in one of our Sisterhood Connect groups, all we need you to do is text the word Sisterhood to 55498 for a list of groups that are happening in May. Be sure to get connected into community. And lastly, if you are new or newish to Crossway, we want to encourage you to take a next step with us here. We say that it's an opportunity for friends to become family. So tonight, after our in-person 5 p.m. service at around 6.15, Pastor John and I, some of our staff team and our key leaders are hosting our Next Steps class. So if you're watching this now and you're new to Crossway and you're in town, we would love to invite you tonight at 6.15 to join us for the Next Steps class. You can just text the word Crossway to 55498 now to reserve your spot, or we'll drop a link in the chat at the the end of the service. I hope you enjoy the rest of our worship time together. We love you. Hey guys, how we doing? So good to be here with you for part two of our teaching series called A Good Kind of Different. And here's what we're doing over the next few weeks. We are walking through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the book of Philippians, or the letter of Philippians. As a matter of fact, last week we kind of set the tone. We started the message with laying out uh, a little bit about the book of Philippians, that it was originally a letter written by Paul when he was imprisoned in Rome to the Christians in Philippi, and sort of the big push at the beginning was to tell them, guys, remember that you're called to be different. You're not just another Roman citizen. You're not just another Philippian. Here's what you are. You are a citizen of heaven, right? You are God's holy people at Philippi. And so the idea that we, we laid out last week is that one of the big themes of the letter is that the people of God, wherever they are, whether they're in Philippi or you, where you are in South Florida and beyond, that you're called to be a good kind of different, bringing the culture of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven to bear wherever you are. And so that's the, the, the theme that we're going to walk through as we look at this book and just different angles in which God calls us to live like that. So here's what I want to do as we get started right now. I want to open up in prayer. And I want to ask you, if you would, just to pause what you're doing, okay? So just like settle your mind, settle your heart, and let's go to Lord in prayer together and invite him to speak to us, to challenge us, to encourage us, and to call us deeper into our relationship with him. So let's place our palms up as we pray. So now come Holy Spirit and awaken our hearts. God, I pray that you'd give us your vision for our lives. I pray that you'd challenge our presuppositions. I pray that you'd call us to a life of difference, a beautiful kind of difference of living the reality of the kingdom of God. I pray that you'd strengthen us. I pray that you'd empower us, make us new. We ask all this in the beautiful name of Jesus and everyone together said, amen. Well, here's how I wanna start. I wanna start with this question. Okay, here we go. What does the good life look like? All right, what does the good life look like? And when I say good life, here's what I mean. What, what, is, what is the ideal life look like? Uh, if you could design your life, and I know some people think that you can design your life. You can't fully design your life. Now, we have limitations, internal and external limitations that keep us from fully designing our lives. Well, let's say you could. 
Let's say you could fully design your life however you want. You could achieve your vision of the good life. What would that look like? What would your life look like? What would you include? What would you exclude? What would you have more of that you already have? What would you maybe have less of that you already have? What would the good life look like if you were to define it? Now, if I were to ask that question to the average South Floridian, the average American, I think I'd get some of these categories. I got a few categories here. And, and either all of these together for some people or for others, just one or two of these would be the primary focus. But let me walk through some of the categories of how I think the average American would define the good life. You give me your feedback in your own mind if you think I, if I hit this on the, head, the, the nail on the head or if maybe there's a couple others that I missed. But we'll start with this one. How about money? That's a big one for a lot of people. As they think of like, if I could design my life, what would it look like? A lot of people say money, and then you'd say, well, how much? And they'd say, more than I have right now, <laughs> right? More money. Money is one of them. Here's another one that a lot of people would list if they're saying, this is the good life for me, is be health. And health might mean for some people, like that I have a life free of sickness, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, for other people, it means I'd like have a life free of sickness and I'd like a six pack of abs, right? So health, we have money, we have health. These are parts of the good life and the American vision. How about relationships, right? Maybe this is one of the things that would, would come out to you. Like you think relationships and this different types of relationships or different people. Maybe for some of you, the good life means falling in love and meeting the man or woman of your dreams. Uh, maybe for others of you, the good life means having children. Maybe for others of you, it means having a real strong network of friendships, right? Like what is the good life? Some people's money, health, relationships. How about this one, fulfillment? This is big for a lot of people right now. It's, not, it, it, it's like the good life would be I work, but I'm not just working to make a paycheck. I work in something that I feel fulfilled in, right? I work in something that, that brings me satisfaction. I'll give you two more. How about this one, success? This is a big one for our Americans, what it means to live the good life. Uh, when you think about the way parents view their children oftentimes, the good life as projected on their children is not just that their child plays on the football team, it's that they are the star of the football team, right? The good life for a lot of Americans is not just that their daughter is on the dance squad, is that she gets the solo on the dance squad. Are you following success? And here's the last one, leisure. This is huge generationally. There's a big push and idea of like, what would it look, the good life would be, I could travel anywhere I want, right? Get one of those, those school buses and convert it, right? Travel wherever I want, go wherever, go see everything I want, leisure at my leisure. That would be the good life. What does the good life look like? Now, what I want to talk about Today is I want to talk about the good life, but I want to talk about it from a different perspective than just the traditional American vision. Uh, what I want us to see is how the emphasis of the good life from a biblical vision is very different than the emphasis of the good life from an American vision. And so my, my whole goal in this message is sort of to, to push back on the good life notion that, that we often take in as Americans and to bring into view another way of looking at what the good life is all about. I wanna give you a different vision, a good kind of different vision for what your life is called to be, how God created you, what God wants for you, the good life as defined by the Lord. So we'll start Philippians chapter one. We'll read the first two verses again. We started with last week, starts Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Remember that distinction he drew? He's like, man, you're not just another Philippian. You're God's holy people at Philippi. Together with the overseers and deacons, verse two, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, take a look. This is the beginning of the passage we're gonna study today. He says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. Now just stop there for a second. That's a big statement. Can we just be honest about that? Like, it is a big thing to say. Every time I think of you, I throw a prayer of thanks up to God. Like that, there are not a lot of people in your life that you can say that about, right? As a matter of fact, there are some people in your life that you kind of say the opposite about. There, there are some people in your life that every time you think of them, every time their name pops up on your phone, 
Every time you pass by them in the supermarket, every time you see them at work, you pray a prayer, but it is not a prayer of thanks. Does anybody have any people like this in their life, right? It's a prayer of like, dear Lord, deliver me from this person. <laughs> or dear Lord, if they moved out of the country, I wouldn't be mad. God, like that would be totally okay. Do you have any people like that in your life? Or like, God, please give me the grace not to say something that I will regret. <laughs> All of us have some people like that in our lives, and that's not what Paul's after. Paul's after the flip, right? Paul is saying to the Philippians, when I think of you, I pray, not a prayer of God deliver me from them, I pray a prayer of thankfulness. And in your life right now, I'd imagine that there's some people like this that you feel this way about, that when you think about them, when you see them, they're such, they're, they're encouragers to you that you're just like, thank you, God. Like when you have lunch with them, you leave saying, thank you, God, that they're in my life. That's how Paul feels about the Philippians. Like he, he just has this deep love for them. This is why last week we mentioned that some theologians actually believe that the church in Philippi was Paul's favorite church. Now, we don't know that to be the case, but you absolutely can see the love he has for them as we read through these verses. Let me take you through. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with, what's that word there? joy, I'm praying with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel. What does he mean, the partnership in the gospel? When, when he shared the gospel with them, they believed. That's part of the partnership. And then they, they worked with him to help spread the news of Jesus to others. And then when Paul was in prison, they financially supported him to help him in his time of need and to help further his ministry. So because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 7, hey, it's right for me to feel this way about you all, all of you, since I, look at these words, I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Do you see Paul's care and love for them, right? Verse three, he says, I thank God every time I think of you. Verse seven, he says, I have you in my heart. Verse eight, he says, man, I long for you. You can tell the heart of this pastor, of this apostle for his people. And, and, and motivated out of that heart of love, Paul does this. He prays for them. Look again in verse four, in all my what? Prayers for all of you. I always what? pray with joy. He's like, man, my, my heart of love for you is motivating me to pray for you. Now, verses three and four don't tell us exactly what Paul prayed for them about. Like, it doesn't tell us the content. But if you jump down to verse nine, it does, right? And it starts out like this. And this is my prayer. Now, I'm going to read in just a few minutes what Paul's actual prayer was uh, for them. But I want to ask you this question before I read it. Uh, here's Paul. He loves them. He planted this church. He cares about them. He's thinking about all of them all the time. He's praying for them all the time. And by the way, Paul wasn't one of those guys who says he prays for people and doesn't actually pray for them. Like he really prays for them, right? Like he loved them. And because he loved them, he prayed for them. By the way, I want to challenge you. If there are people in your life who you love, can I just challenge you as a follower of Jesus? Pray for them by name. I've said this before, uh, but I'll say it again. There are some people in your life that you love that there's nobody else in the world praying for them by name. Think about that with me for a minute. Nobody else in the world calling out to God on their behalf. Like some of you have husbands, there's nobody else praying for them by name. Some of you have wives that there's nobody else praying for them by name. There's some of your children, nobody else praying for them by name. If you love them, do what Paul's doing, right? Like motivated out of love, he, he prays. Now, what is the content of his prayer? What do you think? If you, if you could eavesdrop in uh, Paul's prayer closet. What do you think he would be praying for the Philippians? Now, here's why I think that's an interesting question. Because what you pray for reveals your vision of the good life. Let me say that again. What you pray for reveals your vision of the good life. You want to figure out what you really believe the good life is? Listen to what you pray about. I really, like, pay attention to the words that are coming out of your mouth and, and what you're asking God for. Here's why. 
Because if you love somebody, you're going to pray and want them to experience the good life, right? You're going to want them to experience fullness of life and whatever you feel that looks like, okay? And so our prayers are towards that end. Think about parents with children. You will never hear a parent, at least a sane parent, pray something like this. Father, I pray for my sons that they would flunk all of their classes in school, <laughs> that they would get bullied on the way home, and that the girl they fall in love with would reject them, you know, in, in really obvious ways. No, like, no parent would pray that. Why? Because that is the opposite of what we feel the good life is. You, don't pray, you pray the good life for your kids. God, let them flourish in school, right? And God, let them have great relationships. That's what you pray for your kids. You don't pray opposite of the good life. Your prayers reveal what your vision of the good life is. Think about a business owner. If you're a business owner, no business owner prays, God, please let all of our vendors break contract with us. Let all of our customers leave us. Would you just do No, why? That would be the opposite of what your vision of the good life is. My point is that when you pray, the things you choose to pray about, the things that you choose to go to God about, like the things that come out of your mouth to God reveal to yourself and others what your vision of the good life is, right? Like what you think things should be like. That's true for you, that's true for me, and that's true for Paul. <laughs> and so what Paul's gonna do in these next few verses is he's gonna tell us, he's gonna give us a glimpse into his prayer closet, and he's gonna tell us what he was praying for the Philippians, people that he loved. And in doing so, he's giving us a picture of his vision of life as it should be, of the good life. And, and, and so I want us to notice, as we read through this, we'll walk through each verse of what Paul's prayer for them is. Now, as we do that, I want you to hear this in two ways. Yes, we're hearing Paul's prayer for the Philippians and in his picture then of what the good life is and what he's, what he's trying to get them to, how he wants them to view what the good life is. But it's not just that, it's also about you, okay? So as, as, as we read these words, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul and the intention is to speak to your heart. So this is God's vision for you of what the good life, the true good life should look like. Verse nine again, and this is my prayer. Right? So this is Paul's understanding of the good life. He's praying in that direction. He starts with this, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. I love how he starts this. I love that he starts with love. <laughs> he says, I, I, here's my prayer for you, okay? I pray, this is the first thing, that your love, this is the good life, okay? This is, this is what you were made for. Your, this is the vision that you should have for your life. That your love for others may abound more and more. Now, why, why does Paul pray that? I think part of the reason Paul prays that is because he knows the teaching of Jesus and he knows that when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said two things. You guys remember, he says, first, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what was the second one? He said, love your neighbor as what? Yourself. So the, the essence, and he says all of this, the, all the law and prophets are summed up in these two things. Love, your love God and love others, right? So, so Paul's like, listen, as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus, as a, a citizen of heaven, bringing the culture of heaven to bear wherever you are, okay, here's the vision you should have for your life. It's gonna begin like this. I want you to think, like, here's what God wants, that your love would abound more and more. In other words, that you would not be stingy in love, that you'd be generous in love. Have, have, you ever, have you ever met a stingy person? <laughs> have you ever met a nickel and dime person? So always counting the, the costs and always this and holds back all the time. There's a big difference between a stingy person and a generous person. You know any generous people that when you go out to, with them, and they're just generous. They're generous with their money. They're generous with their words. They're generous with their emotion. They're generous with their, with their affection. I mean, generous people are, are really, really an encouragement to so many. And Paul's like, here's what I want for you. I want you not to be stingy in love. I want you to be generous in love. I don't know if you've ever been around a person who's stingy in love. It's really rough, right? Because some people have all these boxes they want you to check off before they love you. Well, you gotta do this and believe this and act like this and if you do this, and if you follow all these things, then I'll love you. That's not what he's saying. No, the vision of God for your life, you would be abounding, <laughs> abounding more and more in love for others. But, not, but it's interesting. It's not just that Paul says, I want you to abound more and more in love. He, he says something here that's an interesting nuance. Okay, this is the vision of the good life. You'd bound more and more in love. Look again. Uh, that your love may abound more and more, and then he says this, in knowledge 
and depth of insight. Now, this is, I really think, fascinating. Paul says, I don't want you just to abound more and more in love. I want your love to abound more and more in a particular way, in knowledge and depth of insight. Now, you might think to yourself, what is... What does knowledge and depth of insight have to do with love, right? Isn't love kind of obvious? Just love, right? Sometimes that's how we think, you know? People say, how do you follow Jesus? Just love people, man. If you love people, it's easy. Just love them. Just love them. That's just all you got to do is love, okay? And I mean, like, yeah, and like to some degree, yes. But Paul actually qualifies that. And he says, he says that a mature Christian isn't just asking, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to love. A mature, growing Christian who has the vision of God for their life doesn't just ask, what should I do? I should love. They ask this question, how should I love? That's interesting because the truth of the matter is it is not always clear and it is not always easy how to love other people in the name of Jesus. Like it might seem like it on the back end or you're thinking philosophically, but you take that to the ground, boots on the ground. It's not always easy to, to be clear how to best love people. I'll give you some examples. And this is why I think Paul is saying he wants us, his vi- the vision for life is that we would not just love, but that we would abound more and more in knowledge and, and discernment and how to love well. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a friend who wrestled with drug and alcohol addiction. If you've ever had somebody that you care about that's wrestled with drug and alcohol addiction, here's one thing you know. You know it is not always easy to know how to love them. It's, it's not enough just to go, love them. Okay, well, like how? Because different times, different situations call for different applications of love, right? If someone is using, you might love them one way. When they've been clean and they're in the honeymoon period of being clean for like two or three weeks, you might love them another way. When they've been clean for a year, you might love them another way. We need wisdom. Listen, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus, bringing the culture of heaven to bear wherever you are, the vision of God for your life is that you'd abound in love, but you'd abound in the knowledge and, and discernment. How do I best love? Giving you uh, another example. Maybe you have a friend who is making some choices right now that are destructive and you can see it. Like you're watching them make these decisions and you're like, I know where this is going to end and it's not good. And this friend is a Christian and you're watching them make these destructive choices. And the question is, how do I best love them right now? What does love look like? We need discernment, we need wisdom for that. I'll give you one more example. This is an interesting one. Years ago, there was a book written called When Helping Hurts. And the book was addressing the fact that sometimes American missions movements, in particular like short-term missions movements, sometimes they'll go to an impoverished area out of a heart of love and wanting to like love people, but they don't do it with skill and wisdom. And here's what the book was talking about. And they actually end up hurting the community more than they end up helping the community. They talked about things like sometimes Americans roll into an impoverished area in another country and we come in with this little bit of a savior complex. Like, we got this, man. And we view, and sometimes Americans go into another and they they view the people that they're serving like as less than. And maybe it's not intentional, but it comes across. Talks about how sometimes Americans will come into a particular context and, and rather than dealing with the structural issues that are causing the poverty, they're just dealing with the need and they're never helping to empower the people to come out of that need. One of the examples that sometimes they'll use is like, hey, if you bring a whole short-term missions team to come in and build a building, great, except for the fact is that there are laborers in that community that are needing work, that if you would have brought the funds in to help empower them to build it, not only would they have the satisfaction of building, but you would have provided for their families, which made a bigger impact on their life. Here's my point. I'm not against short-term missions. My brother's a missionary. We do short-term missions. I'm all for it. The point is when you do it, do it well, right? How do we love with insight? How do we love with discernment? Okay, so so vision of God. Paul's praying for them. God's vision, right? What is your life all about? What's a good life look like? Well, it's a life abounding in love with wisdom and discernment. Notice what he says next in verse 10 so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So you're able to discern this, filled, notice, with the what? What are those next three words? The fruit of righteousness. What is God's vision for your life? What what is the good life? Part of it is that as you love others with insight, that your life would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Can I just tell you right now? Right now, your life is filled with the fruit of something. I don't know what it is, but it's something, okay? 
and, and the something that your life is filled with depends on what you've cultivated. Right? So if, if I were to buy two small fruit trees, let's say I buy a lemon tree and it's in a pot still, and I buy a mango tree and it's in a pot still, <coughs> smaller, I take them to my house, and the mango tree, I don't put in an area that has sun. I never water it, it's in the shade. I don't ever plant it in the ground. I don't take care of the, you know, the pests come. I don't deal with the pests. I just kind of leave it there. And then I take the, uh, the lemon tree and I plant it and I fertilize it and I make sure it's got the right amount of sun, make sure it's got the right amount of water and I take care of any, any bug problems that might come on the tree. Let me ask you the question, which tree is going to bear fruit? The tree that's gonna bear fruit, or at least the most fruit, is gonna be the tree that I've cultivated. You following me? The same thing is true in your life. What fruit are you bearing right now in your life? Maybe you're bearing the fruit of health. Great, it's because you've cultivated. Maybe you're bearing the fruit of your business succeeding because you've been cultivating that. Maybe you're bearing the fruit of a good, healthy relationship with some of your friends because you've been cultivating it. Here's what Paul's saying. Here's God's vision. Here's, here's the number one part of the vision is that you would bear this kind of fruit, the fruit of righteousness, like that you would cultivate and then bear the fruit of righteousness in your life, which looks like what? That you would be walking around with the fruit of love and fruit of joy and fruit of peace and patience and kindness and long suffering and the fruit of the presence of God in your life. Now, all of this, okay, all of that he's praying, this vision that he has of what the good life looks like, man, we're bounding in love, but love with insight, and we're bearing fruit, comes to the head at this final thing that he says, because this is the essence for him of what the good life looks like. Verse 10, 11 again, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says here at the end, to the what? To the glory and praise of God. Can we just say that again? To the glory and praise of God. This is the big picture, okay? What is the vision of the good life according to the scripture, according to Paul, right? Our, our prayers for people reveal what we think the good life is. Paul's saying, here's the good life, Philippians. Here's what it's all about, okay? Here's what it looks like, is that you would live a life abounding in love with insight, bearing fruit of righteousness. And all of that would lead to this place that you would live a life that brings glory to God that the things that you say, the things that you do, the things that you think, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, the way you orient your life, how you schedule yourself, every, the way you treat people, everything about your life would bring honor and glory to God. This is the summation of the whole idea of what Paul's saying. This is the vision for our life that we would live for the glory of God. Um, in uh, 1646, there was a group of pastors in London who got together and tried to put together, sort of encapsulate a summation of the teaching of Christian doctrine. And they did it in which is form of what's known as a catechism, which is sort of questions and answers. So they had a series of 107 questions and answers about like what is God and who is God and who are we and what is the Bible and all these primary Christian doctrines, right? Summation, 107 questions and answers known as the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Some of you might be familiar with it and um, some of you might have heard of it before. It's been very influential. And the first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, this is the, like, the beginning question, right? Number one is this, what is the chief end of man? Of course, man here is not just males, humanity, women, you know, what's, what's, what's our chief end? Why, in other words, why are you here? Like, what is the actual vision for your life? Right? What is God's vision of what the good life is for you? What is the reason for which you are on planet Earth? Like, what is the essence? Okay, you gotta, that's what he's asking. What is the chief end of man? Big question. And like, this is why we exist, the vision for our lives, our purpose, the good life. And here's the answer that the Shorter Catechism gives. It's this, what is the chief end of man? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. As a matter of fact, can we all just say that out loud? What is the chief end of man? Let's read that out loud. To what? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Listen, that vision of what life is all about, of the good life, of why we're here, that vision is very, very different. <laughs> 
for the for the Philippians than most the vision of every other Roman citizen who wasn't a Christian. Like that wasn't they were not walking around going like, man, how do I just how do I just live my life for God's glory? How can I enjoy Him for that was not the vision. Okay, and for you, 21st century South Floridian, watching this message. Okay. For you, this idea that the good life or the purpose of your life, the reason why you exist, what it's all about is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Can we just be honest? Like that's not how most of your coworkers are thinking about their lives. That's not how most of your friends orient and shape their lives. That's not how most of your family members orient and shape your life. That is a very different vision of life. It's a good kind of different. Uh, and, and, and so it causes us, sort of causes me to ask you this question. Um, are you asking yourself this in your life? Are, are you asking yourself in the decisions you make and the time choices that you make and, and the relationship decisions, are you asking, does this bring glory to God? Is this the driving force behind your life? Is this the vision for your life that, man, I want to bring glory to God. I want to abound in love and the fruit of righteousness so that I can bring glory to God. Can we just be honest? For many of us, this is not the case. Like this is, this is not how, it's not just not how our neighbors live. It's not just not how the vision that our friends have for their life. For many of us, it's, it's honestly not the vision we have for our lives of what the good life looks like that the good life would be, I exist to bring glory to God and enjoy him forever. Now, why is that the case? Why is our vision of the good life so different from what Paul is bringing about here? Why is it that our prayers often sound so different from what Paul is praying here for the Philippians? And, and I think that the answer for many of us is that uh, many of us have unwittingly bought into the American vision of what the good life is rather than the biblical vision of what the good life is. Like, I think for some of us, we have not even realizing it, just taken in, what is the good life? And we just taken the, the American answer to that question and we brought it in as if this is the biblical answer to the question. We just taken that in, right? So it's about money, it's about health, it's about leisure, it's about success, it's about freedom, it's all these things. We just taken that vision. This is the good life. I have all these sort of American dream kind of things. And, and what I wanna say is uh, we have to recognize that if we're gonna be able to live a life of differentiation We've got to recognize that the American vision of the good life sort of works as those things, money and health and, and success and leisure and relationships and all that kind of stuff. And, and I would say that in a lot of ways, the American vision of the good life it isn't anti-Christian, meaning like it isn't like, and don't be a Christian, or that's bad, right? I would argue that, that the American vision of the good life has all these things that seem really good, and it's sort of ambivalent to spirituality. It's like, here's the good life. Get all of this stuff, money, health, and all this. And hey, by the way, if you get a little bit of Jesus in there, great, more power to you, you know? But don't miss this stuff, right? The, the money and the health and all, and then the success and all that. That's the American vision. The, the biblical vision is completely different. It, it literally flips it. And it goes like this. The key thing that we must have in the biblical vision of the, of the good life is that we live a life for the glory of God that honors God in everything we do. And the other things, money and health and success and leisure and relational, all that stuff, that's secondary, right? So the thing that we must have is glory of God and living for him, deeply rooted spiritual life, and the rest of it's secondary. That, that, that's the difference, right? And I maybe I'll illustrate it like this. Um, my wife is the one who primarily shops for us. She, she knows Publix, okay? She knows our Publix. She knows what's on what aisle. She knows what brands of food we get. Some of you are the shoppers in your family and you're, you're like, yeah, I know. And some, if you're the shopper, by the way, if you're the shopper in your family and you send the non-shopper in your family to go pick up stuff, everybody knows that could be dangerous. So I think it pull, bring all sorts of things that they shouldn't have gotten. Right? Just, just, they don't know where everything is. So I'm the non-shopper. And every now and then my wife will say, hey, honey, can you stop by and, and pick up some, something on your way home? No problem. Happy to do it, right? So let's say my wife says, we're making tacos tonight. Here's what I need you to get a pack of El Paso or Old Up, whatever that is, El Paso taco seasoning, okay? Bring, that's what I need you to get, bring it home. So I walk into Publix and I have a problem. My problem is not only do I know, not know where the taco seasoning is, which means I've got to 
wander around, because you know I'm not going to ask somebody for directions. I'm just going to wander until I find it, right? Not only do I not know, but the second problem, and I was talking to someone in the church about this, I was talking to Charlotte about this the other day, <laughs> is that when I get into Publix, I also am drawn in by all of the options. Does this happen to anybody? I just start walking around like, oh, I know I'm here for El, you know, El Paso taco season, but what about this? And what about the Cuban crackers? And I think we need some milk. And, and the thing that I've been into recently is I like to, to wander through the fruit aisle and try to find fruit that I haven't eaten yet. Does anyone ever do this? And try something new. And so the thing I found recently is called a sumo orange. I don't know if you've ever had a sumo orange. It's like an orange, but sumo size. And, and I bought one the other day, and it was amazing, incredible. Buy one, tell me what you think. And then I bought a few this last week. And so, so here's what'll happen when I go, and the non-shopper goes to shop at Publix. Um, I'll get all these extra things that were not on the list, and maybe I'll remember to get the taco seasoning. So when I get to the house, all this stuff I bought, um, my wife, as long as I got the taco season, she's fine. So she's, she's okay with the fact, she's not mad that I got the sumo orange and all the rest of the stuff as long as I got what I was there for, right? As long as you bring the taco seasoning, you're good. Get all the rest, that's a bonus. Now, what's that all about? Think about it like this. The American vision of the good life works like this. The taco seasoning, the thing that you have to get is you know, whatever that health or money or success or leisure or pleasure or whatever, right? And the, the uh, sumo orange is, yeah, and you can have a little Jesus sprinkled in if you want to. And the biblical vision of the good life, completely different. The taco seasoning, <laughs> It's this, the thing you must have, the reason you went to the supermarket, the reason you exist on this planet, the vision for your life, live your life for the glory of God, <laughs> overflowing in love for him, overflowing in love for others, bearing the fruit of righteousness so that you're living to honor him. That's, that's the difference. Now, here's the thing. The problem is that we've so imbibed and so taken in the American vision that sometimes we don't see the difference and sometimes we think that's God's vision. Now, here's, here's what I wanna say. It's not, and this is important, it's not that those other things are bad, okay? Like, it's not like you should never pray for health. Some of you are like, man, I'll never pray ever for health or for money or around John. He's gonna think I'm some sort of you know, pagan Christian. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying those things are bad, right? It's just that they need to be in their proper place. That's the point. It's not that you shouldn't pray for those things or want those things or, 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 or work towards those things. It's that they need to be in their proper place after and behind living life for the glory of God. So, so, so just think about it like this. Imagine two men have lived a full life and they die. Okay, Two very different situations. One guy. He was a well-known tech entrepreneur, active on social media, people loved him, created all sorts of amazing things, and wealthy and influential and, and, and had a lot of money, and he dies. He has no relationship with Jesus, or it's sort of this stagnant sort of spiritual faith. And, and it would be a very a far stretch for anybody at his funeral to say that that guy lived his life for the glory of God. It's just like, that's just not how he lived, okay? So you've got that guy, which, which embodies, you know, all of the American ideals, right? He's just got all the money and the fame and the leisure and all, he had all of it. Like he was he's very successful in the American vision, but, but he didn't have a robust relationship with God. It was a stagnant faith, if any, and certainly wasn't living life for the glory of God. Now, I want you to envision another guy. This guy lives in, in a poor area of Nicaragua. We've been there before. And uh, it's the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And, and he's over there. And um, he doesn't have access to great health care. And he doesn't have a lot of opportunity for uh, financial, you know, being able to, to, to do really well financially because of a lot of the constraints there. And he's not well known. And he lives his life in relative obscurity, except for the fact that everybody around him knows that this is a man full of love for others. The fact that everybody around him knows that this is a man filled with the peace of God. The fact that everybody who interacts with him knows that this is a man with the fruit of righteousness, right living, cares for his family, cares for his wife, cares for other people. And at his funeral, if someone were to ask, did this man live for the glory of God? The answer would be over and over and over again, a resounding yes. The question is, which one of these men lived the good life? Like, which one? 
because our tendency is to go like, that's the good life, man, the wealthy guy and the, the guy everybody knew. And, and, and the scripture's like, slow it down. No, 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 no. The essence of your life, the vision for your life. Remember, we're different. And the good life begins not with the health and the money. And all. It begins with living your life for the glory of God. If we get the other stuff, great bonus. And it's not, but that is the essence of what the good life looks like. And so my challenge to us is that we need to reorient our thinking around why we're here. We need to reorient our vision about why we exist and what our life is about and what we're going after. And just two quick thoughts on how we can do that to sort of reorient to God's vision of the good life and not just the American vision. Two really simple, practical thoughts. First one is this, align your practices to God's vision for the good life. Align your practice. What I mean by practice, align your life. If, um, if someone were to be able to have access to your calendar over the last month, I mean, I'm not just saying like your, what you wrote in your Google calendar, but like, let's say someone had an actual copy of everything you spent your time on over the last two months or last month, and they could see wherever you spent your time, whatever you did, right? If someone were able to do it, and they were to look at your life, right? What would they think based on how you spent your time? What would they think that you believe the good life is? Would they think it's health? Would they think it's money? Would they think it's your business? Would they think it's your friends? Would they think it's Netflix? What would they think that you, that you think the good life is based on your time? Here's the thing. If, if we're gonna make some progress in, in reorienting our vision of the good life, then what we've gotta do is we've gotta reorient our thinking. And we've gotta begin by changing and aligning our practices to God's vision. So we start changing what we do. So let me say it like this. If, if the good life is a life of somebody who's overflowing with love for God and love for others and bearing the fruit of righteousness and living for the glory of God, then guys, let's, let's just be honest. One of the practices is that we need to begin and, and regularly be in the word of God. Like if that's the good life, that's what we need to start with. <laughs> and, and not just talk about reading. Like we've got to spend time in the word of God. That changes us. Right? If that's the good life that we're after, th then we actually have to prioritize time with God in prayer. Like it's gotta be the, one of the things that we say, I'm gonna do this and I'll hold off on other things because I'm gonna spend time with the Lord in prayer. You follow me? Like we prioritize. We prioritize time in worship with God and God's people. I'd encourage you, by the way, if you're able to, now as, as, uh, you know, this last year has changed a lot of our rhythms, but boy, if you're able to from a physical level, come and begin to join us in person, I wanna encourage you to be there. There's something that happens when we gather with the people of God and we're singing and studying together where we're orienting our lives around and centering our week around the worship of God, those practices that we are, are placing in our lives help remind us of what we actually believe the good life is, and it reorients our thinking. So begin by aligning your practices to God's vision. Ask yourself this question, are the practices of my life right now demonstrating that I believe that the good life is living a life for the glory of God or are the practices of my life right now demonstrating that I'm looking and running after something else? Here's the second and last thing. Not just align your practices, align your prayers to God's vision of the good life. And I mentioned it earlier and I wanna be super clear. I'm not trying to say, don't ever pray for those things that I listed, money and health. I'm not saying don't pray for that at all. I pray for those things for people all the time. That's not what this is. What I'm saying when I mean align your prayers to God's vision of the good life is certainly we can pray for those things, but here's the thing that so many of us are missing in our prayers is that we're not praying for the things that Paul was praying for. Like, like when was the last time you prayed for yourself, God, let me live my life today for your glory? Like, when was that? out of your mouth. When was the last time you looked at your kids and said, God, I pray for my children that they would abound in love for others and they would bear the fruit of righteousness in their life? When was the last time you prayed for your friends? God, let them grow in wisdom and understanding and how to love others well. My, my point is that, that we can pray for the other things. Absolutely. But boy, if we're gonna be people who have a vision that the good life is a life living for the glory of God, guys, when you pray for yourself every morning, begin to start asking, Lord, Today, help me live my life for your glory. Tomorrow, God, show me how to love well today. <laughs> the next day, God, let my life bear the fruit of righteousness. We gotta start praying that for ourselves. We need to start praying that for our children. We need to start praying that for our family. 
We need to start praying that for the people of the church. God, like do this work in us, okay? Because if we really believe that's the good life, then that's got to be the stuff at the front of an end of our prayer. Sure, we're going to pray for health and we're going to pray for success and all that. But man, let us pray for the thing that is primary, which is that we're going to live lives for the glory of God. What do you think would happen if we actually did that? I mean, like think about it. Like what would happen if just your family, you and your spouse, if you happen to be married, started to to pray those prayers. God, here's what I want above everything else, above success, above health, above money, above notoriety, above a six pack. (laughs) Here's what I want. I want to live for your glory. Show me how to do it. Like what what would happen if, if, if multiple families and individuals in our church started praying? What if our whole church, I mean, think about it. What if we actually started aligning our practices that we believe that this is what life is all about? We started aligning our prayers that we believe that this is what life is all about. I'm gonna tell you, it would shift. It would change things. It would change things in your family. It would change things in our church. And I believe it would change things in our community because you would start living a good kind of different. And we would together start living a good kind of different. And so that's my prayer today. And that's how I wanna close. I wanna pray that God would give you a vision of what the real good life is. that he would give you a vision of living for his glory, that you would catch this understanding that the most important thing that you could ever do in your life is to be someone bearing the fruit of righteousness to bring honor and glory to God. And I wanna pray that God would shift some things in our lives individually and corporately so that we would live this out and not just talk about it. Let's do that, let's pray. Father, it is so easy for us to get wrapped up into the American vision of the good life. So easy. God, I confess that I have done that various thing on many occasions. And so Lord, as a church, uh, I just wanna pray for us that God, you'd help us see something new. I pray that you would begin to give us a new imagination, an imagination of the kingdom of God. I pray that you'd give us a new vision, that, that men would wake up tomorrow morning and there would begin to be this shift in their lives to say, what, what am I really here for? I pray that there'd be women who wake up tomorrow morning, there'd be a shift in the way they think, that you would start to give them a new way of seeing the world. And I pray, Lord God, that more and more, we would align our priorities and our practices to, to show what we really believe the good life is. I pray that we would align our prayers on this. I pray that you'd raise up in our church the next generation who live for your glory and not just for stuff and live for your glory and not just for likes on social. I pray that you'd raise up husbands and wives who would live for your glory and not just for more things in their lives. God, I pray that you would change us and that, God, you would drive this deep down so that we would bear the fruit of righteousness for your glory, that we would live a different, a good kind of different. And in that, we would make a difference in the world around us. We ask all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everyone together said, Amen and amen. Well, guys, thanks for joining us online today. So thrilled uh, that you're here. Let's put this into practice this week, all right? Let me speak this blessing over you uh, as you go. As you go, Crossway, go and live your life for the glory of God the Father, resting in the grace of his son Jesus, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit because you are a city on a hill and a light to the world. So go in peace.